This is The Strange Recital, a podcast about fiction which questions the nature of reality. My first meeting with the ancient was also my last. It was in a private reading room in the library of the small university where I serve as an adjunct professor of English. My specialty is in medieval studies, but as the call for such archaic disciplines in the days of this story is negligible, I often find myself teaching courses in communication, technical writing, and research. Still, I occasionally feel the call to revisit my medieval roots, particularly at the end of a semester, when my hopes for the future of English as a discipline and humanity as a species are at their lowest ebb. I had just finished giving an exam in Intro to Communications, the second of three that week. Stepping outside, weary and defeated, I was confronted once again by the bleakness of the world and the futility of my place in it. Then, as I often did in such moments of quiet yet profound turmoil, I turned my steps toward the library. Libraries have always been a refuge for me, but this university library was in a special haven. I had made the wondrous discovery on my first day of employment that the library housed a small collection of manuscripts, treatises, and anthologies from or related to the Middle Ages. On that particular day, I selected a few volumes and retired to my favorite of the library's private reading rooms. It was not until I had my hand on the knob that I looked through the window in the door and saw the room was occupied. That was my first glimpse of the ancient. He appeared to be a middle-aged man with a dark but luminous complexion. His features were clean, almost boyish, and his long silver hair was pulled loosely back from his lean and softly lined face. Even seated, he was remarkably tall, but by far the most striking feature of his appearance was the fact that Despite the dim indoor lighting of the library, his eyes were completely obscured by large, dark sunglasses. My first thought was that he must be blind, and I looked down at the open book on the table in front of him, expecting to see a braille text. To my surprise, I recognized one of the treatises from my treasured collection, a bestiary, detailing the origins, characteristics, and mythos of imaginary creatures found in the medieval lore of diverse cultures. I am usually a private person. On any other day, disturbing the restorative solitude of a fellow sojourner in the wasteland of academia would be unthinkable. However, so deep and heavy lay my end-of-term despondency upon me. So desperate was I for the barest hint of kinship in the ever-burgeoning desert that I opened the door without knocking and entered. I beg your pardon, I ventured politely. But I thought I was the only person at this school who even knew about that book. Glancing down, I saw the section he had been perusing, and smiled. Ah, Griffins. They've always been a favorite of mine. Are you partial to any particular region's lore? He lifted his head. Though his eyes were hidden, the sorrow emanating from them was so palpable, so profoundly inconsolable, that I stepped backwards, my hand still on the handle of the open door. He gazed at me from behind his glasses for a long moment. Then he spoke. My friend is gone. His voice was higher than I would have expected for so large a man, and yet rich, sonorous and void of affectation, like the ocean's eternal breaking of its own heart against the shore. The grief in it drew me in towards that shore, and I stepped forward, closing the door behind me. I remember a sense of reverent unease that was simultaneously disconcerting and exhilarating, like a man who trespasses on hallowed ground only to find himself both welcome and expected. I am sorry, I said, unsure of the decorum in this new world into which I seemed to have stumbled. When did he pass? A sharp intake of breath, almost a gasp, and then the lapping tide of sorrow became a wave of anger sweeping towards me and yet not directed at me. Pass! The voice still high and resonant was riven now by bitterness. He did not pass. Had he passed, he would be blessed. Had he passed, I would be content. The wave reached its pitch and I was borne up on it, suddenly afraid that it would sweep me away, depositing me back on the bleak sands of reality. He did not 
pass. The voice was almost a cry. He died, cruelly and senselessly, and alone. The wave receded. It had not cast me ashore, but rather drawn me even further out, into the tides of my companion's desolation. I took another step into the room. When? The voice was quiet now, its force turned inward. That, like any inquiry that deals with time, is an impossible question. For you? Long, long ago. Many lives of humankind. For me? His voice grew even softer, and I took another step in leaning forward to catch the next word, just above a whisper. Yesterday. A tear slipped from behind the glasses and lay glimmering on his dark cheek. It was a strange, unearthly tear, like a liquid diamond, multifaceted and illuminating the room with its own radiance. I held my breath lest it shatter. Then, whether compelled by some sacred instinct or merely by old habit I know not, I reached into my pocket pulled out my handkerchief, and offered it to him, stretching my hand across the table like a pilgrim seeking pardon from a saint. For a moment he hesitated, as if holding some internal debate. Then he reached out one long arm and took the handkerchief. His hands were what one might call artistic, thin and delicate yet strong, made for fine detailed work. His suit was linen of a dark cream color. His shirt was uncolored, he wore no tie. Holding the handkerchief in his hand, he looked down at it, hesitating for one more moment. Then he raised his other hand, I saw it was trembling, and removed his glasses. He held the handkerchief to his eyes, soaking up more scintillating tears. His shoulders shook slightly. I stood still, willing my presence to emanate both respectful distance and compassionate nearness. Finally, he lowered the handkerchief. Holding it in one hand and his glasses in the other, he lifted his head. He looked at me. And at last I was certain of what I somehow felt I had known all along. This man seated at the table in front of me was no man at all, for these were not the eyes of a human. They were light, solid white light, as if the sun had folded itself into his skull and could only escape through these two small openings. It was a burning light, but not scorching designed to penetrate and illuminate, but not to destroy. The light came from him. It was itself him, his very essence, laying bare both his soul and the souls of all he looked upon. Confronted with such imperative revelation, one must make an immediate choice, to stay, receiving and reciprocating the enlightening, or to flee. I sat down across from him. Who are you? I asked, my mouth suddenly dry. He smiled, faintly and wryly. My name, I am afraid, would mean little to you. It is in the language of my people, which is spoken only through visions in the mind. Very few of your race have thoughts quiet enough to receive such speech, especially in recent times. He paused, half in renewed sorrow and half in consideration. Still, he went on, if you are willing, I could try to share it with you. I would be honored, I said, suddenly conscious of the frantic noise inside my head, the relentless cataract of my perceptions pouring endlessly down into a roaring whirlpool of thought. I squared my shoulders against the internal onslaught and faced him. He nodded solemnly and placed his hands flat on the table, palms facing up. Slowly, reverentially, I reached my own hands across the table, placed them in his, and looked into his eyes. My mind went as dark as an empty stage. A hush fell over the thought torrent, like the expectant silence that grips a full theater in the moment between the curtain speech and the curtain rising. Then, unfolding on the void like an iris in bloom, an image blossomed. A long line of figures scattered over a plain landscape, reaching to the horizon in every direction. Each figure, as far as I could tell from the vague outlines, was bestial and even fantastical in shape. Some forms I recognized from my beloved medieval treatises. Some were unknown. All the figures seemed to be carved out of light, reverse silhouettes in a scene of growing darkness. Indeed, as I watched, the lights began to go out. Figures disappeared from my mental stage, slowly at first, but then more rapidly and even in groups. Whether they were disappearing of their own accord, 
or being snuffed out by the swelling void around them, I could not tell. But one thing was certain. The disappearance of any figure concentrated the light more powerfully in those remaining. The amount of present light would never change, regardless of the number of vessels. As I found myself wondering what the potency of such compacted light might do to those remaining vessels, I realized suddenly that there was only one left. One solitary figure of light, surrounded by darkness, drowning in darkness, pushing back with its very existence against the darkness. It was my companion. At least, I knew it was my companion, as one knows the unknowable in a dream, but his appearance was strange. The figure was not that of a man, but something bird-like. What's more, he was burning, burning with an inner flame, the source of which was akin to yet other than the light that had compressed itself into his form. This light blazed from him and reached out to me, boring into me, passing through me and out beyond me, and yet filling me, filling me until I was sure I could not contain it, certain I would shatter. Abruptly, the stage of my mind went blank once more, replaced instantaneously with the constant, thunderous tumult of thought of which I had never before been conscious. My companion released my hands and lowered his eyes, gazing again at the book on the table. That is your name, I said, finally, after several long moments during which I tried to quiet the tumult and remember each detail of the vision. He nodded, but did not look up. Is there a word for it in my tongue? He kept his eyes on the manuscript, but I knew he was pondering. Then, perhaps, he said and returned his full attention to the text. Perhaps. I mused over the vision, searching for the defining characteristics and words that might match them. One came immediately, but I pushed it away, searching for a term both grander and more subtle. Finally, when nothing else seemed to fit, and my companion had turned the page and was studying an artist's illuminated rendering of a griffin, I ventured, It feels like... the last... He looked up so quickly and so intensely that I faltered. Could that be close? He gazed at me in silence, light from his eyes flooding the room, overpowering the dim weariness of the fluorescent ceiling tiles and infusing even their garish parody with true radiance. Finally, he spoke in a voice both weary and wistful, like the ghost of a man reading the etching on his own tombstone. When all that cannot last at last is shaken, and life is made a burden yours to rue, then watch and wait and will your hope to waken till comes a hand that reaches out to you. When all that can be lost has long been taken, preserve through grief the only tale that's true, till all that once was ancient and forsaken is found, redeemed, and made forever new. He paused, regarding me. I had the distinct sense that I was being sized up, that he was weighing me, debating the dangers of some great disclosure. That verse was spoken over me at my making. He smiled, trifle sardonically, I thought, and went on. Many believed it to be an omen, and my existence has certainly seen all their fears come to fruition. Others thought it was meant as a comfort and an instruction. In my younger days, and even at the beginning of the wasting, I tried to embrace the comfort and comprehend the instruction. But my strength withered long ago, and the wasting still goes on, as indefatigable as it is execrable. And I have failed at both the embracing and the comprehension. Though he gazed at me still, I sense now that he did not see me but rather looked through me and the walls and time itself, searching endlessly and fruitlessly for something that could not be found. But you are here, he mused suddenly, and you have stayed. Perhaps, if you are willing, I could tell you my story, and we can decide together if I have failed. I nodded, unable now to speak, nodding gravely in return, he placed his hands once more upon the table, palms up. I reached out, put my hands in his, and looked into his eyes. His light burned steadily into me, and he began, unfolding the vision on the stage of my mind.
That was the prologue to the novel The Ancient, written and read by R. A. Nelson. Nelson is Ruth Ann Nelson, and she's here with Tom and me in the studio today. Welcome, Ruth. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. We just heard the prologue of your novel, The Ancient. It appears that the mysterious being is about to tell his story. Is that story essentially the content of the novel? Tell us a bit about that. Yes, the prologue and the epilogue are really just bookends. The bulk of the story takes place in a monastery in 10th century Ireland, where the last two ancients, uh, the one we just met and his friend the Faithful, who is a griffin, they meet a young mortal blind boy who lives at the monastery, and the three of them together, once the boy stumbles upon their secret, they try to make one final stand for the light against the forces of the wasting. Hmm. Well, can we assume the narrator might be a stand-in for yourself with a love of libraries and a passion for medieval documents and mythology? I love reading, <laughs> and I'm a big fan of myth and of mythology. I read a lot of Tolkien and Lewis, so I guess more modern day myth. There's a, a quote by Madeline Langle uh, that I really love, wherein she describes myth as that which was true, that which is true, that which will be true, that strange truth which is as elusive as home. So I really believe in our need, our need for story mm. for both personal and communal identity, the need for myth, particularly in the modern day. That's a huge passion of mine. Hear, hear. <laughs> now, there's something else interesting to me. I learned in our correspondence that the narrator of your novel is actually a man. The clues were cut out when you trimmed it for this recording, so... Our listeners are having a little reality shift right now. The story they just heard in a woman's voice is actually told by a man. Uh, but actually is the wrong word, too, because it's all fiction. But the story is protean, shape-shifting. So what are your thoughts about that? I've been thinking about this a bit. The narrator really could be male or female. We don't spend very much time with him. It's just the beginning and the end. But in my mind, he, he's a man. That's how, why I wrote it that way. But this story really is about stepping inside someone else's shoes and seeing through their eyes. So hopefully the, the shape shifting, the reality shift, will be of the kind that allows everyone, the reader, writer, narrator, to see through each other's eyes and foster empathy. You know, we could uh, pitch shift your voice down and make it sound more masculine, if you like. Um, <laughs> I'm a big fan of Doctor Who, but I'm really not interested in sounding like a Dalek or a Cyberman today, so thank you. <laughs> okay, we'll leave you as you are. Yeah. Uh, I noticed that the prologue seems to be infused with a sense of discouragement or even despair about the times we live in both on the part of the narrator and the Ancient One himself. Now, you know, sometimes it just seems obvious that the world is a mess and getting worse, so we tend to take that dark feeling for granted, but maybe we can explore it a little here. Could it be that this feeling of impending doom is actually the wellspring from which your novel was born, so creation out of emptiness? I keep encountering this idea of hope in my writing, how to live in hope when all seems lost or increasingly more lost. There's a theological idea of presence and absence that I've done a lot of study in. Presence and absence not being enemies, but partners. Mm -hmm. Whereas you need absence in order to make room for the creation of presence. So I, I do believe that, that even the, the bleakest moment of loss can be redeemed and renewed into a seed of new hope, like a phoenix rising from the ashes. That image, that message is really central to the novel. 
and uh, typifies the impact I want my writing to have on the world. So thank you for asking that question. I, I am very passionate about that. So that applies also to the concrete dystopian reality that we seem to be sliding into. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. You know, I wonder if your narrator's inner vision of the creatures of light could suggest that present day humans like us, not just those in myth, might also have a parallel existence on a different plane of reality as beings of power, like the dimension of dreams. Or maybe it's all just metaphor. But if language makes thought and thought is real, metaphor is another plane of reality. You are speaking my language. <laughs> uh, the importance of the word is central to this novel. It's really the only quote-unquote weapon I gave my characters. Uh -huh. And um, the significance of, of seeing is essential too. They spend a lot of time uh, having conversations on what I call the plane of spoken sight, hmm. wherein they, they do converse by creating images in one another's minds. And the, the mortal boy gets to learn that language and get to, to converse in it. So I, I guess I'm trying to show the importance of words and communication and how it shapes us. So yes, I in, in the idea of, of there being a, another plane of reality, I do believe that. I believe that this book in a way, expresses my firm belief in a reality with a capital R that exists beyond reality with a little r and is breaking through in moments of wonder and beauty. So hopefully, if people read, it will make them think twice about everyday existence and even about other people. Uh, in The Weight of Glory, C.S. Lewis said, you've never encountered a mere mortal. None of us are really just human. To be just human is something far beyond even our wildest imaginations. Mm. Well, we like the idea of making people think twice, too. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I understand you've also published a trilogy. I'm not really into this whole thing of genre pigeonholes, but is there a trilogy in a similar genre to this book? And what genre would that be? <laughs> the trilogy is something completely different. Um, it was my first foray into novels, and it was really my coming-of-age story. It's set in the modern day. There's not a unicorn in sight. Um, <laughs> it's based uh, actually pretty closely, the first book, on my term spent studying abroad at Oxford when I was in college. And so the main character is very much me, and it, the trilogy follows her, you know, college, beyond college, struggling in the new young adult life, yearning to get back to England, just like I was. Mm. Um, and so she, Anna Merritt, the heroine of the trilogy, is kind of exists in a very different world. If I had to pick a genre for the ancient, and I, I did some thinking about this in my attempts to, to market it, um, I think I created uh, my own genre, mm. and I <laughs> I called it historical theological fantasy. Mm. So we'll see if that if that takes off. Yeah, boy, genres uh, just an artifact of industry marketing, really, that has very little to do with stories or literature. Uh, same thing for, for me. I'm I'm hating trying to fit my new novel coming out into one predefined slot or another. So you publish independently. Is that an experience you enjoy? It is. Um, I initially published the first two novels of the Gatekeeper trilogy with um, an independent publisher, uh, a very small company. And so having done both, um, I can firmly say that I, I prefer the self-publishing experience thus far. I really enjoy having uh, more control, particularly over the timeline of when the book comes out. There was a lot of waiting. Yeah. Um, and also, I, I am an, an editor. I'm a freelance editor and a writing coach, so I do all of my own editing. So it was nice to have more of, more of a handle on that and more of a say in how the book was presented and when. Yes. We've just launched Recital Publishing, which is an offshoot or imprint of this podcast, The Strange Recital. So keep your eyes open for that. Yes, and tell our listeners where they can find The Ancient and your other work. Well, my website would be a good place to start, www.ranelsonwriting.com. You can find my blog there and also links to all of my works, or you can visit Amazon um, and search for them there. They're available in both paperback and also a variety of electronic book forms. Great. And thank you, Ruth, for coming in today. 
Absolutely. Thank you for having me. And uh, speaking of the ancient, my back is stiff and my feet hurt and I'm tired and my hair is all gray, so maybe I'm a supernatural being. Maybe. This is The Strange Recital on the web at thestrangerecital.com. On this episode, you heard two excerpts of Gregorian chant by Kevin MacLeod, or is that MacLeod? You also heard some throat singing, a piece called Kumi One, number four, by DJ Griffin. A little synchronicity at work there, perhaps. This is episode 19072. And now I must find Brent and wake him up. <laughs> 